Hey everyone, welcome back to another OSCP Journey video. This is going to be another like non-technical update that uh, I'm just going to go over some key points, uh, hopefully some advice that, that you all find helpful, and also just to kind of share where I'm at with my journey and what I've learned so far, and just, just helpful things that I would have liked to know going into this that may help other people. So with that, let's dive into the first key point. That's going to be time management. So time management's really, 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 really important uh, when it comes to the OSCP. So you have the 30, 60, 90 day course. Uh, you can pick pick any of them. That's really up to you. For me personally, like I mentioned in my last video, I'm on the 30 day course. And that that's for two reasons, really. One, because it's the cheapest course and it's really easy to negotiate uh, paying for something with your employer if you can get the price down. So while I'm sure I could have convinced them that I needed the 60 or 90 day course, uh, they're pretty supportive in that in that regard. Um, it's just an easier conversation to have with the with the cost of the 30-day course versus the others. Uh, but that also worked out for me, and that was my plan from the get-go because I have a personal goal to achieve this certification before the time DEF CON rolls around. Now, that's just a time milestone for me. It has nothing to do with DEF CON. We don't give a shit if you have an OSCP or whatever. If you go to DEF CON, it's about being a hacker. Uh, that being said, that is my personal time gap. That's when I want to have achieved this by. And so the 30 day course gives me the lab time I need and the uh, access to course material I need within a small time frame to take a first crack at the exam and then also schedule another uh, attempt should I not make the first one and still be kind of achieving my, my goal if I am successful. So that's the whole goal here is I want to be successful. So hopefully that, that all pans out. However, that's just for me. That's how I'm doing things. That's why I'm doing things that way. Uh, but that may not be for you. You may want to do the 60 day or the 90 day course and that's fine. All of that is up to you and how you want to go about it. But regardless which one you pick, you need to manage your time. Now, what I mean is that in the 30 day course, I'm having to really hammer out a lot of hard days and 3 a.m. nights and and really go at it to make sure I'm getting the most out of the course. Um, because if I miss a week, I miss a whole week of lab time and a whole week of access uh, to things that I could be practicing in the practical manner of the exercise for the, the course material and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, if you are going to be doing certain things around uh, the lab report, which well, I'll talk about in another point, uh, it's going to be a real time sink and you've got to really get that stuff done. Now, if you're just going in, you're using, you're learning the course and you're not going to do any of the extracurricular stuff, then that's a little bit different. But that's why I say it's really up to you, but it's going to be important to manage your time. Um, and it's going to be a little bit easier to manage your time with the 60 or 9 day because you have more time to, to play around with. That being said, it's going to feel really bad if you waste your time. And if you waste too much of your time, you'll watch that 60 days go by and you'll forget that you're in the course and you forget to take your exam. And you'll procrastinate. I don't know. That's uh, I'm, I'm not saying any of you specifically will do that, but I those are just kind of fears I have. If I were to take a longer course, I may procrastinate for more weeks at a time. I'm not really, I wouldn't consider myself bad in terms of procrastinating, but um Sometimes I will take advantage of needing rest and I'll really get rested, which is good. You should, but, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to abuse that. And that's just me personally. Um, don't, don't take that in, the wrong way on, on any of your ends, but, uh, that's just, that's just how I kind of operate. That being said, time management is always going to be really important, but like I mentioned before, though, you may not want to abuse the, the days that you have with 60 or 90 day courses for resting. It is okay to rest. Even in the 30 day course where I talked about, you know, maybe you miss a week. That's kind of not great, but you need to rest. You know, these 3 a.m. nights that I've had, not exactly healthy. Don't recommend doing that. Um, uh, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> so, um, it, it really is okay to rest. I've gone on a vacation while I've been in the labs. I've been to a, a buddy's wedding. I've been doing some of my own things, even just taking random days off here and there. I've, I've probably wasted more time in the, the course than I like to, but you've got to rest. You will get burnt out really, really easily if you don't rest. So make sure you plan and, uh, in your time management to account for needing to rest. Cause if not, it leads us to my next point you'll get burnt out really, really easily. Uh, it is so easy to get burnt out in the course because you're going to want to make all the progress in the world and you're going to feel really good or you're going to get really frustrated. And you're know, you going to go through all kinds of emotions while you're in the labs. And it's okay, uh, but it really is easy to get burnt out. So resting is so very important. So keep making progress 
but take breaks. You know, don't don't stay up till 3 a.m. unless you've just got to. You're on like your last day of the course and you've got to pop one more box so you can get that report or you're not quite done with the exercises. Whatever your goal is there, that's that's one thing. But don't don't just do like I've been doing and staying up till 3 a.m. for the entire work week and go go f- like what three hours of sleep, 3 a.m. 6 a.m. wake up for work. Oof. Yeah, don't do that. That's bad. Um, you will get burnt out. It's really tough. Take it from me. I am literally burnt out now, but I'm pressing on and I'm taking time and I'm getting rest. I'm taking my own advice and getting the rest I need and taking the breaks I need. Uh, you do that too. That's very important. So time management, don't get burnt out. Those are probably the two most important things that I'm going to say in this video today. So if you want to stop watching now, that's okay. Uh, but next up is going to be our report requirements. So um, the report requirements are for both the exam and the lab. However, there are some differences. So for the lab, you have to root all the machines that you're going to include the report. So user shells don't count. They don't get you any points. I think that may be a little bit different on the exam. I'm not really sure. I think you may get partial credit for a user shell, but I don't really know. Don't quote me on that. However, for the labs, um, I went in thinking that I would just get as many as I got, write up a report, and call it good. That's actually not how it works. There is a minimum number of boxes that you need to break into in order to get points on the lab report. So the lab, doing the lab report gives you five bonus points on the exam if you do it to completion. And that can be make or break in a situation where you're close, but you're not like excelling on the exam, but you're real close. That five points can put you in range passing. It's just a nice little safety net to have. You only have to do it once. If you retake your exam again, uh, I believe you can reuse your, your previous lab report. There's no reason to do it again. Um, so that's five points of safety net. That's nice to have if you choose to do it. It's not a requirement. You do not have to do the lab report. It's purely extra credit. So yeah, to get those five bonus points, you have to get 10 boxes in the lab, 10 unique boxes. There are a couple of duplicate boxes on the network that are popular or easy to tip over or whatever. Uh, it, just because you hack those, each of those individual boxes again doesn't mean you have two individual boxes those boxes are the same they just have different ips so two 10 unique boxes and they all have to be rooted slash you got system for windows um without that they don't count so 10 unique boxes that are rooted and then here i have to include uh each each snippet requires i think a, an ip config or an if config dump show the ip of the box you've compromised who am I output if, if the system supports it? And then also, of course, showing your proof text, the, the output of that is all required in a single screenshot. And then also a blurb about how you compromised it. So, uh, you know, you ran in map, you found MSO at 067, um, it was vulnerable to it, you ran a custom exploit, and you got a shell. So, you obviously will want to be a little bit more professional and a little bit more descriptive than that. Uh, but luckily, they provide you a template and they kind of tell you exactly what they want. And it's really straightforward, it's not anything complicated. I feel like my pen test reports for work are far more complex than the pen test report for the PWK. And that's because one, they fill out a lot of the predisposed fluff for you. And two, uh, they really only care about one thing and that's your process. They want to see that you were able to identify vulnerabilities, exploit vulnerabilities, explain how you exploit the vulnerability and show that you did it. That's, that's really it. It's looking for the professional technicals of it, not necessarily full report writing skills. Although that is important. If you do not do what they they explicitly ask you to do. You can even come up with your own report format if you want to, but that's why they provide the template. They want to set a precedent and an example for what they believe a good baseline for a report is. So as long as you follow that, you're, you'll probably be all right. So make sure you, you read through thoroughly and include all the information they require because uh, I think in some cases, if you don't, uh, you'll miss out on some key points. Uh, so for the lab report, you can't just root machines. You also have to do the coursework. It is a requirement. I did not realize this and I wasted a week. So the first week I did my PWK, I focused purely on the course and I went through the entire course and it was great stuff. And, but I, I was, oh, I was planning to do the lab report from the get go to get those five bonus points. And I never did the coursework during the lab. So that stuff I said in the first video about how you have an option to use either the videos or the PDF is only true if you're not planning to do the lab report. If you're planning to do the lab report, you have to do the exercises that are outlined in the PDF. You have to. 
Um, they are going there now. There are some exclusions, and they will list those as you go through exercises at the top of the exercise. If it's not required, it'll say this one's not required for the report. It will tell you. But for the most part, anything else in the report is going to be required, and you have to tack that on to the end of your lab report to receive the five bonus points. So if you're going for that, do the coursework. If not, don't worry about it. And the last part is the exam report. Uh, so all of this information I'm giving is, is publicly available. It's, it's on the website. I'm not revealing any secrets, but I'm just kind of clarifying, and I'm going to link the the site in the description. It's just a little bit hard to find, but it is out there. It's got all the questions about the rules for the exam. It's got the report samples. It's got the PWK um like VM, custom VM, it's all publicly out there if you want to take a look at it before you dive into the course. Um, so the exam report is the exact same template that you use for the lab report. The only difference is obviously you don't have to include coursework with it and it's only going to be the five systems in the exam. So uh, as long as you follow the same instructions for the lab report uh, on the exam report, you should be good there. Not a whole lot to that. Now on to the actual course itself. Schedule your course one month in advance. Only if you need a weekend slot. If you don't need a weekend slot and you can do it in the, uh, during the weekday, then that's fine. You, there's no need to schedule your course early. I say this because I just had to schedule my exam for a month out. Uh, I won't be taking my exam till the end of June. And that is because I needed a weekend slot so that way I wouldn't have too much time off. Uh, hopefully I won't even have to take PTO for my job personally. But I know uh, a lot of people, if you're not working and this is like a certification you're trying to get so you can get a job, uh, you may not be able to afford to work during the, the weekday because maybe you need the weekday time to do whatever else you're doing. Maybe you're working a part-time job or, or whatever have you. You need weekends. Uh, weekend slots for that reason are very, very popular. You don't want to take time off so you're doing the exam of the weekend. It's 24 grueling hours of hacking followed by another 24 to get your report in. So obviously you want to not miss too much time, but also me personally, I want, I want to have some weekend left over. So uh, I kind of compromised and I had to shoot for a Friday, Saturday slot and that is also very popular. So Friday, Saturday, and Saturday, Sunday slots are just really, really popular. If you don't schedule them in a month in advance, you're probably not going to get the slot. So basically, as soon as you start the course, especially if you're in the 30-day labs, go ahead and schedule your exam. Even if you're not quite sure that you'll be able to take it that day or not, go ahead and schedule it. And you can always reschedule it again uh, closer to time. Just make sure you keep up with that and make sure you do reschedule it when it's time to reschedule. Um, otherwise, you'll get in some... some uh, kind of coordination trouble with offset and you don't want to do that you want to keep things as smooth as possible um but yeah uh that's probably my biggest advice if you don't need a weekend slot well just pick whatever slot works for you but um that's that's probably some advice that i saw everywhere everybody was was saying that all over the internet and i took it for granted and now i'm gonna have a whole month between when my labs end and when i can actually take my exam and so that's going to be uh on me to really keep up and keep reviewing the material and playing some hack the box and doing some vuln hub machines so i'll still have some ocp journey videos in between in that in between time but it's going to be uh all on me to supply that material for myself it won't be any more labs that i can dive into all right and so now i want to talk a little bit about the forums so the forums are this big mysterious thing that you only get access to if you're in the pwk course and that's for good reason um they give you a lot more detail about what goes on in the course. And obviously, I'm not going to give you any actual information from the forums. You need to be a student. That is very much important. However, I will talk about what the forums are good for. And this will be great if you're new to the course and don't know where you're going or what you're doing. Say so you just signed up. Or if you're just interested in what goes on behind the scenes and to, to know and understand what kind of environment you're thrown into. So the forums are... Uh, I, I think they're great in a lot of ways. They have some great references for the coursework. They've got some great community help from other students. Uh, and they've also, to me, I think this is really cool, is the old pen testing with backtrack forums. They're locked, but you can go view them. And I just like to go see what, what it was like uh, when in the older versions of the course and what kind of problems people were running into. Because they had slightly different requirements and, you know, some exploits didn't exist. And just the, the things that they did to, to get into systems, it's kind of cool to read read through. But... Uh, there's not really um, any answers on the forum per se, but the labs do have plenty of discussion 
and hints, and they can be a bit spoilery at times. Uh, that being said, Offsec moderates the forums really, really well, uh, so you see a lot of redacted and, and cut uh, stuff from where people spoiled information, but I have ran into one or two forum posts where it's not giving you the answer, but if you're already close, it gives you enough to push you over the edge, which is great if you're really frustrated, but like it, it feels kind of bad if you were like wanting to figure that out yourself, because it is a little bit of a spoiler, but it's really not that bad. I'm just kind of throwing that out there because you might dive in and say, oh, I don't know what to do here. And then somebody's like, oh, well, I got their forum post will be like, oh, well, I found the LFI. And you're like, oh, it's an LFI. And you didn't even know that because you'd never finished enumerating. It's stuff like that. You, you aren't given where it is or how to exploit or anything like that. But you didn't even know what it was in the first place. And now it was kind of given away. So there's a little bit of that. But, I mean, the, those forms are there for hints. Now, there's nothing like that on the exam. There's no hints like that. That's too much spoiler. You can't do that. But in the labs, you're there to learn. So it really is okay. That's just a, a, a bit of a warning. But that being said, the forum has great advice. And most importantly, you're struggling together. <laughs> so um, all the people in the forums that are, are posting everything and trying to get help, you get to see them struggling with the same things you're struggling with. And it just honestly, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel like less of an idiot. <laughs> That's just me anyway. But uh, they, they really do offer some great advice. There's some awesome riddles in there to kind of guide you and poke you and prod you in the right direction. And then just some great discussion about uh, every so often about what mindset you need to be in and say, hey, and people are like, hey, well, have you – tried to enumerate the service or, or what have you. I've seen a lot of posts recently about how the try harder um, kind of mantra is not really the way to learn. And I actually, I honestly haven't seen a lot of that in the forums and in the labs. There is plenty of try harder and it's a mantra that I, I personally enjoy somewhat, but you know, sometimes you do need an actual push. You, you may just not know something and it's a learning opportunity for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. And try harder isn't exactly the most thorough answer you need. That being said, when it comes to an exam, you can't get hints and it's an exam. It's a test. Now you can like talk to offsec officially and, and try to get some, some help if you're having like legitimate struggles. But when it comes to the lab environment, when you're learning, uh, honestly, the response I've seen in all the forums has not been try harder it's it's usually did you try this uh, or think about this new thing people are really responding that way and I've, I've really enjoyed seeing that that was that was a lot different than what I expected and I hope it continues that way um, so they're giving out great advice and the struggle is, is together but um, the most important piece of advice I've gotten is probably reference the course material. And I'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about my uh, old process versus my new process here in a minute. But referencing the coursework is so important because if you encounter um, like a SQL injection or something like that and you are having trouble, you know it's vulnerable SQL injection, you can get some basic error output, but you cannot do what you're trying to do successfully, like maybe it's blind or, or, or whatever have you, and you're having trouble exploiting it and getting the data you need, um, you can just go reference the course module that talks about SQL injections. And nine times out of ten, it is exactly how they do it in the course material. This They're not trying to trick you. These machines are legitimately vulnerable. While it may not be the same services or the same applications or the same exact vulnerabilities that are identified on the machine you're working on in the lab versus a machine they practice on in the course, um, the technique is usually verbatim the same. So go back and reference the course. You will get so much further if you just pay attention to what they did and understand why they did it that way. I can't tell you how many vulnerabilities that I've exploited by just going back and finding the one key thing I wasn't doing right because I didn't pay close enough attention to the course materials. Like It was something I would totally just destroy and know how to do uh, 100% except for it's actually more like 99% because I forgot this one thing and all my years of experience are, are mattering nothing right now because I forgot that one thing. And so just be humble, go back, reference the course material and you'll get a shell. It's really that simple. Usually these boxes are vulnerable. They're there to practice on. They're there to learn from. They're not trying to trick you. This is not a CTF. So with that, I have developed kind of a new process and I want to go over how what my original old process was and then we'll kind of dive into the new process and how I've uh, and why I've kind of gone that direction with the OSCP. So my old process was obviously a lot of enumeration starting off did some in map uh, followed um, 
follow a little bit of IPSEC. Um, so do a lot of in-map, do default default scripts, initial scans, then follow that up with a full port scan in the background. If you find a web service, start running GoBuster, and just let all those automated enumeration tasks run in the background, get those set up and moving, and then I would move on. And usually, personally, I like to target web services first because I am uh, I'm a web weenie. Uh, I was I've done web development for for many years prior to ho hopping into InfoSec and just software development in general. So if there's an application, uh, I like to go after it and see if I can exploit it. Uh, so that's usually where I start, and I'll start diving around, look for what's that text. You know, if I find that it's WordPress site, I'll start you know trying different credentials, or maybe start a WP scan. You know, it, it, at some point, it just what you do in your process just depends on what you find and what your attack surface is. But always, 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 if there's something to enumerate, I pop it into a tool and I let it enumerate. So uh, big shout out to Ipset because he's really evolved my process. Uh, going into my professional career, um, I had, you know, a good process. I did a lot of the things I'm talking about now, but I didn't have things structured and organized very well. And Ipsec provided a really good baseline with his Hack the Box video. So if you're, like, struggling and you don't really like your process that much, I think Ipsec has a really good baseline to start with, and you just kind of build off of that. And mine's built into something brand new. So I still do all that same enumeration. However, for the PWK specifically, what's brought me the most success is realizing that these machines are vulnerable. I know I've already said that, but that's so important. You realize these machines are vulnerable, all of them, whether it's in the exam or the lab, that's the whole point. They're not trying to trick you. It is literally a bath of filthy machines that are full of all kinds of vulnerabilities. It's there like that for a reason. Some of them are harder to exploit than others. Some of them are challenging, but it's it's literally there to practice professional pen testing. So new process involves, involves a lot of enumeration. Uh, do standard in-map scans and all that kind of stuff. But usually I get a shell using the following pattern. I'll enumerate, do initial in-map scan, identify a service, and in the background I'll run an in-map scan with uh, these Voln skips script. Uh, that is tac tac script equals vuln and you've got to be careful with that because it is actually launching real vulnerabilities and in real environments and even in the lab you could risk knocking something over or running an exploit or something like that while it checks for vulns but mmap is your best multi-tool and all the scripts are your best friends because you cannot use vuln scanners on the exam however you can use the shit out of nmap and mmap i in my opinion mmap is honestly the best vuln scanner there is in some regards um so I do that, and I let that run in the background, and then I go do everything else that I normally do. And then usually the MAP Vuln Scanner will come back with something. And if it comes back with an RCE, great, usually that's it. If not, um, then it may give you some more information about what's on the servers. Maybe it finds uh, some directories, some robots of text, or some... Um, new uh, information about the service fingerprint to help you detect operating system version it'll just give you some more information it's good to run in the background now if the vuln scan doesn't give me a vuln to to go off of next doesn't matter if it's rc or not if it's just something i can move on to if it doesn't give me anything usually through manual enumeration i'll find something if i'm having a hard time exploiting it I'm going to go back to that, that point I just talked about on the forums. I will reference the course material. If I'm trying to exploit Nellify and I'm really screwing it up and I'm doing it wrong, but I know it's an LFI, I'll go watch the course module on LFIs. And usually I've missed a step and I will do that verbatim and it will work. Even though I, I was like right on top of it, that's usually the next step is just go back and learn. Remember, you're in a lab, you're in a course, these machines are vulnerable. That's the refined process that I'm kind of using for the OSCP. And that does translate really well to the real world. The only difference being that not all the boxes in the real world are always vulnerable and that's okay. However, what you're kind of refining as part of the PWK is to find those low hanging fruit and be efficient and kind of move off of the information you have and pivot around and enumerate effectively and quickly in a time constrained environment. What tools and what, you know, flags and settings on those tools how well do you know your enumeration uh process to refine it down to be efficient um and that's that's really what they're they're kind of helping you learn because my original process was i thought was pretty good i've i there hasn't been a pen test where i have not found some major uh thing to report on and it's always been successful and brought a lot of value so i valued my current my current process but uh or my original process, but my new process here, I think 
I've added some game deficiencies. However, some of them are course specific. Like I may not run a Vuln scan every time. It's kind of noisy, uh, but you you kind of understand what you're you're looking at from your target perspective. If you know something's vulnerable, then this is a good way to go at it. And this is also just a pretty good kind of way to approach CTFs or vulnerable labs in general. Like in, in the the cases where you know stuff is vulnerable, this is a really efficient kind of workflow. So that's something I've kind of learned. And all it has done has brought me shells. And I have enjoyed it so far. I'm still pressing on through. Like I said, my exam scheduled for a whole month out. I'm going to have some update videos in between as long as I have time. I'm not going to really make any promises on that, though. Uh, I'll do my best. But uh, once the labs are over, I'll be mostly doing some uh, Hack the Box and maybe some more Vuln Hub uh, machi machines. I'm hoping I'll be able to get all the material I need done for my lab report. If not, I'm not going to sweat it. You shouldn't either. Make your goals, set them, set your expectations, and try to achieve them. But... Remember, this is for learning. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how you learn. So just because you didn't uh, stress yourself out and meet your goal for your, your lab report doesn't mean it's the end of the world. And that's something I have to remind myself of. So hopefully that's helpful and uplifting for you all. I hope this has just been helpful to gain some insights on what it's like on the other side. Uh, obviously, I can't really give any details about any of the machines I've popped. You can follow my Twitter feed. I'll, I'll post every time I pop a machine. Uh, I wish I could talk more about them because the labs are a ton of fun. If nothing else, uh, I, I've seen people talk about the uh, maybe some complaints about datedness of the machines. Honestly, they're really not that dated. There are a couple of old, older machines and older technologies and older systems, and they're, they're there mostly to teach you how to identify them, how to identify a vulnerability in the first place, and how to exploit it. And some are easier than others, but the, the range of different things and, and exploit paths and attack surfaces in the lab are, are great. There's some phys there's some social engineering stuff. Uh, there's some uh, client side attacks. There's um, all kinds of stuff. I haven't even touched yet. I just know what's in there and it's just really cool to think about. But the, the stuff I have seen I have touched has ranged from AV evasion on the hardest end to, um, you know, just simple something that has a Metasploit module that you can throw at it. So there's all a wide range of stuff and, and uh, it's just all about thinking outside the box and honestly trying harder, trying new things, going and Googling uh, how to how to get past stuff because they don't teach some of the stuff in the course, but you got to remember the course focus, you know, isn't on, you know, AV evasion or binary exploitation or all that kind of stuff. And they, they don't pack the labs full of that either, so don't worry. Um, but you do run into like minor examples that you have to think, oh, I haven't seen this before. Let me go look up this behavior and why that's happening and figure out what's going on so it's just it's providing immense value and if nothing else it's just a hell of a lot of fun so i really wish i could extend my lab time and just just to play i i'm, I'm having a great time just so many shells uh so yeah uh for those going into the course good luck um I hopefully this is helpful for you for those considering it i hope this was also helpful information for those who are just watching my inner video my videos for entertainment well, I hope this was entertaining. If not, oh well. Um, regardless, like and subscribe. You know, support the channel if you want to. But uh, above all, thanks for watching and thanks for supporting my journey. So that's all. Till next time.